So today we're just going to do some really quick atomic review. Uh, it's just going to be two questions that I'm going to post and I want you guys to give them a try and then of course I'll go over it. Uh, but the majority of today is actually going to be spent working on our atomic physics homework assignment, which is the last homework assignment, of course, of this entire course, really. Um, and I will give you quite some time to, to be working on that because it's not going to be due for a couple weeks. But anyway, let's get started here. So it's going to be a relatively shorter lesson today as I'd like to spend some time working on the assignment, like I just mentioned. It's going to be a U-try, I go over kind of lesson. We're going to do only two questions. We're going to do one that's kind of like a Thompson experiment. Uh, and then we'll do another one that's kind of like a Bohr model style question. Uh, I'm not really sure how else to call these. Might as well get started. So first one here, a particle with a speed of 5.25 times 10 to the 5 meters per second and a charge to mass ratio of 1.76 times 10 to 11 coulombs per kilogram uh, enters into a uniform magnetic field of 175 micro teslas. If the particle travels perpendicular to the magnetic field, what will the radius of curvature of the particle's path, what will be the radius of curvature in the particle's path in the magnetic field? Anyway, pause the video here, give this one a shot. I'll go over it in just a second. All right, so I'm gonna go over this one now. First things first, just to kind of keep track of everything I've got, I'm gonna make a little data bank. V is 5.25 times 10 to the five. Uh, and then we have this next one, a charge to mass ratio. This is what's kind of unique in this course, uh, that a charge to mass ratio isn't a singular unit, it's actually two different units in one. Charge to mass ratio is Q over M, because it's charge to mass, it's ratio, so it's a fraction, and that's going to equal 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. And I guess I should put meters per second on this one. Uh, the other thing we have here is the uniform magnetic field. This one's always tough to remember what the letter is for this, like what's, what's the variable that we use for magnetic field? It's actually B with an arrow, uh, so that's 175 microteslas. I'm gonna make that 175 times 10 to the negative six regular teslas, okay? Uh, now, the rest of the question kind of gives us a hint as to what formulas we need to use here, because it says if the particle travels perpendicular to the magnetic field, and if you remember your, your third left-hand rule, uh, or I guess third right-hand rule, we don't know if this is a positive or a negative particle, we were just given the charge. I mean, I guess we can assume it's a positive one, so we'd have to use our right rule, but it doesn't matter, left or right here. Uh, when you're going perpendicular to a magnetic field, you're going to have a deflection. And the deflection often occurs, of course, in a curve, and it says right here the radius of curvature of a particle's path. Long story short, when you have a curvature, Remember that curvature means that you have a centripetal force, so an FC, uh, and your centripetal force just always acts kind of like a net force. It's always equal to some other forces that are present here. And the only other force that we were at least uh, told uh, exists in this case is our magnetic force. So we have to say FC is equal to FM. Now let's break down the formulas here. FC isn't directly on your formula sheet, but, it, uh, but acceleration centripetal, AC is. AC is V squared over R. FC is just if you times mass by that. So MV squared over R equals FM. There's two FM formulas on, on your formula sheet. Remember, use the one for an individual particle, which is QVB. Uh, and then we can clean this up, actually, because there's a, a velocity on both sides. This velocity is going to cancel out with one of these velocities. So I'm going to knock down that squared, and I'm going to knock out this one. Uh, and then the other thing I'm going to do is, remember, one of our variables we were given was Q over M. So I'm going to divide by M on both sides. This is gonna leave us with V over R equals Q over M. Technically I could put QB over M, but I'm gonna put Q over M just to make it very clear that that's its own singular piece, uh, and then times by B with the arrow. So again, that B with the arrow, the magnetic field could go on the top here. I'm just not going to, so you can see we can keep this thing separate. Now, ultimately in this question, we're looking for the radius. Uh, so it'd be nice to get R all by itself. Uh, I'm actually gonna save that for a little later um, because again, when you divide, usually you think, oh, well, in this case, you have to divide by B and then times by M and then divide by Q. And then that's just kind of weird because we want Q over M intact. It's possible, there's a way to do it, but uh, we don't need to worry about that. So let's just throw our numbers that we have in here because we have everything except for R. Uh, this is going to be five, ooh, that was awful. Let me start that over, put it in brackets. 5.25 times 10 to the five over R equals Q over M, I'm just gonna leave that as 1.76 times 10 to the 11, uh, and then times by B with the arrow, that's 175 times 10 to the negative six. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna like multiply these two things together. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of bounce all over the place here. This is really, really unprofessional job I'm doing on this one, but whatever. Uh, so 5.25 times 10 to the five over R equals this times this, which is, one second, three, 0.08 times 10 to the 7 
Uh, and then of course we want r all by itself. We just need to times it over to this side and then divide away this 3.08 times 10 to the seven. Long story short, you're gonna get r is equal to 0 0.0170 meters. That's three sig digs. Uh, but as much as that is a, a totally fine answer, uh, I think it might be better to put it as centimeters. So I'm gonna say r is equal to, just knock this uh, decimal over a couple places. You'll see r is equal to 1.70 centimeters. There we go, good to go. So hopefully you were able to get that one. Uh, again, it just comes down to setting your FC equals to your MM, or, or your FM, there you go. All right, next one, this is a bore kind of question. Suppose an electron moves from the negative 5.5 EV orbital to the negative 1.6 EV orbital. And of course, we're dealing with a mercury atom. Uh, different atoms, of course, have different energy levels, right? You have to have the blueprint in order to be able to do these. Uh, determine the frequency of the photon associated with that transition and state whether it was absorbed or emitted. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of time on this one and I'll go over it in just a second. All right, I'm gonna go over this one now. Uh, first things first, when you're going from this orbital to this orbital, so you're going this way, or I guess how we usually would draw it is a straight arrow going this way, um, that means it's actually gaining energy, right? That, uh, that electron is gaining energy. And uh, if you're the kind of person who just looks at the numbers, you might go, well, 1.6 is lower than 5.5. Well, no, that's why they make these negative, um, because negative 5.5 is in fact lower than negative 1.6. So you need to be gaining energy to do this. Now, the source of that energy has to be some sort of incoming source of energy, right? So like, because energy can't be created or destroyed. Uh, so there has to be some source of that energy. And that source of energy is, of course, a photon that must have uh, strike that uh, electron, causing it to gain enough energy to move up to that other orbital. So that answers this, the, the last part of this question right after that. This is going to be an absorption question. This, uh, this electron must have absorbed a photon in order to gain some energy to move up to another orbital. If you have an uh, electron that goes down orbitals, that's where you have an emission. So in other words, where a photon is released. Because again, going down means you have less energy now, and that energy has to go somewhere, so it gets released or emitted as a photon. Anyway, and this one's definitely an absorption question. Uh, now, in terms of how that photon uh, was absorbed, you had to have exactly the right amount of energy to move it from this energy level to this energy level. So what I would do is I'd find the difference between these two. Now, I usually leave this as a positive number because dealing with the negatives just becomes a little bit strange. So I'm just going to say 5.5 minus 1.6, and that gives me a difference of 3.9 electron volts. So in other words, this electron would have had to gain 3.9 electron volts to make that transition. Now, 3.9 electron volts is a measurement of energy, and we can just say that that energy is the energy of our photon. So we can just say that's the photon's energy because the photon provided exactly that amount of energy uh, to get it there. Now, how do we find the energy of a photon? Well, there's a, a formula in your formula sheet that says E equals HF. Uh, and of course, this is the energy. Uh, we're looking for the frequency and H is a constant. Since we're dealing in electron volts, you'll have to use the H that has electron volts. So let's throw all these in here. E is 3.9. H in electron volts is 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15. And then F is what we're looking for here. So just divide by the 4.14 times 10 to the negative 15, and you're gonna find that F is equal to, uh, to just two sig digs, 9.4 times 10 to the 14 hertz. There we go. Now, if you wanted to go really crazy on this one, you could actually like look up a chart um, and determine you know, what kind of photon that is. Like you could say, well, like if, maybe if it's in the visible light spectrum, maybe what color of light it is. Uh, but the question wasn't even asking us to go that far, so that's all you really had to do from there. Uh, if you wanted to find the wavelength, you, of course, you use the universal wave equation. But again, I'm just, you know, going, going nuts on this one. We did not have to do all that. So there, kept my word. That was actually a really short lesson, even with the amount of time you would have spent by pausing. I doubt this was more than about 20 minutes in total. Um, I know the video itself is only about nine minutes here. So uh, for practice, please work on the atomic physics assignment. It's posted on Google Classroom. It's available as of uh, today, or at least as of the day you should be watching this. I'm recording this on May 20th, so I'm kind of speaking as if it's the future here, just full disclosure. Uh, but just so you know, you can currently complete up to question 11. That's about a third of the entire assignment. And I'm giving you guys lots of time to do today. Remember, you're supposed to have uh, 36 minutes of instruction per class per day. I've only given you about 10 here. Well, 20 if you had like really all actually did all the work. So you got tons of time to work on this, in other words. I'm giving you like a work block. Uh, and just a heads up, we have a formative quiz to review these concepts next class. It opens uh, today. So if you want to do it early, go for it. 
Um, but I would start picking away at that assignment. And just like before, I will provide the answers to that assignment, but I will wait until way, way later on, because uh, I don't want you just giving the, the, the answers right off the bat. Uh, usually I'll release the answers like a day or two before it's actually due. Uh, anyway, that's enough rambling for today. If you need any help, uh, please let me know.